Welcome back children to my imagination bubble where together we uncover the secrets of the universe. Today, why don't the voices in our heads stop? And also, plot armor. because not even six bullets to the head can stop bad writing. And I've created a whole companion video to this one discussing more famous examples of what isn't plot armor, despite what people think, and some truly awful examples of it as part of my ongoing Beyond Writing series, which you can get access to with the CuriosityStream Nebula bundle, linked below as they have kindly sponsored this video. Part one, let's be honest, sometimes it's just bad writing. You write yourself into a corner and you come up with some dumb, contrived excuse of a way to get out of it. And the reader noticed. Graham the Wizard Who Likes Cats is floating through the vacuum of space, bleeding out from 62,000 million stab wounds, and he just happens to pop a magic pill from the spaceship, and you've never heard of it, and oh, suddenly, it's just a flesh wound. It's dumb. You know it's dumb. The three-eyed man who whispers to me from under my bed that he knows. He knows. <laughs> he knows it's dumb as well. I don't like saying this because I like giving more helpful advice, but sometimes there's really no other solution than just to write a better scene. Like there's this one time where Arya gets stabbed several times in the stomach and falls into sewer water and then stumbles around the town and seemingly heals up just fine the next day. They should, very simply, have just come up with something better. They should have written a better solution for Aya to get out of this, or foreshadowed the solution better. Or at least just don't write them into a corner where it requires a contrived solution like this in the first place. It's why plot armor often feels like deus ex machina or just luck. The problem, a lot of the time, is a few pages back. And if it feels contrived to you when you're writing it, if you're kind of arming and ahhing, it probably is. But. I'll let you in on a little trade secret. We make characters survive for plot reasons just because we want them to all the time. Plot armor is just when we don't hide that very well. See, plot armor isn't actually a problem with main characters not dying. I think a lot of the time we just get fatigued with the question of whether characters are gonna get hurt or die with no follow through and we stop believing, we stop caring, we see behind the curtain and we see the plot armor. That's why it's really a problem with one, a lack of immersion, or two, a lack of tension. Especially when, part two, the writer breaks the rules they originally set up. Like, nobody is annoyed because heroes in a CW superhero show aren't getting hit by stray bullets like the bystanders are in the weekly let's see how much more whipping this dead horse can take episode. No, we're mad because the show is terrible. See, a ton of stories have this more lighthearted approach to death and pain where if you die, you get to one, conclude your character arc, two, probably go out heroically, and three, someone probably important will kill you. Doctor Who, Marvel, Star Wars, they all work by this kind of logic. And people love these stories, we all do. It's part of the charm of these fictional worlds where there's this purpose and poetry to death that we don't get in real life. In this weird masochistic way, we like imagining that characters we love are in danger because it gets us invested and we buy into that fantasy. You know how sometimes a character will go and mend their relationship with their estranged brother and then they'll say, ah, I can't wait to retire into my old age after this, after this big epic final battle. Like, they're already dead at that point. There's no hope for them. They're already in the ground. There is no coming back from that in these kinds of stories. But plot armor isn't really something people complain about, not as much as you might think, because there's this underlying understanding that there are different rules for death. And here's the thing, going back on those rules can destroy immersion. But let's compare Game of Thrones, those CW shows, and Daredevil, each of which have very different narrative rules around death and pain and injury. So in Game of Thrones, Ned Stark dying is meant to signal to the reader that main characters, one, are not safe, and two, can die in seemingly anticlimactic ways. Whether or not their arc is finished, it doesn't need to be heroic, there can be questions that are still unanswered in the narrative, and it can be something stupid. There's this massive story in the books, it doesn't appear in the show, where one character goes to like meet Daenerys' dragons and there's whole chapters leading up to it and then he's just roasted in an instant doesn't go anywhere. <laughs> but in season seven and eight, our characters were suddenly surviving things that these rules said that before they probably shouldn't have. 
and you can buy it a couple of times, but it was happening over and over and over, with the most egregious example being Arya stabbed several times in the chest, in the stomach, chucked into the sewer water, and then fixed up pretty easily afterwards. This wouldn't be plot armor though in a lot of stories, you know, but it feels like it is here because it breaks the established rules of Game of Thrones, and more importantly, it undermines the tension that the show originally had. Calling plot armor is really saying that there's no real tension in these scenes anymore. Daredevil on the other hand goes out of its way to show how Matthew Murdock will come away with sustained injuries when he fights, even if he's just going up against random nameless goons. Now, we don't think that he will die, it's not that sort of show, but getting paralyzed is certainly on the cards in a way that Marvel or Doctor Who or the CW gym suits just don't really play with. Like, one character in Arrow is paralyzed and then is magically cured like four episodes later. <laughs> Each of these create different expectations around death and tension. And that's okay. I mean, you look at anime and there's wildly different rules around death and injury and pain, right? But going back on the rules that you establish can rob a story of uh, tension and immersion because we get drawn into a story by being convinced that there are stakes, that things matter, right? And if what you said mattered before no longer matter, it's... Eh, and people say plot armor. It's usually okay to make the rules of death harsher, but a lot more difficult to make them easier. It's often connected to flanderization, where characters become more extreme versions of themselves, and power creep, video on that. So ask yourself, what expectations do you give your readers throughout the story, and does any given survival contradict in-world logic that you've demonstrated? And, carefully, this includes part three, inconsistent characterization. The hero just blitzes through thousands of minions with lives and dreams of their own, but the moment they get to the killing genocidal maniac at the top, suddenly, oh, I can't do it, I'll be no better than the bad guy. Well, boo-hoo, Janet, you're already ten times worse. It's always obvious, isn't it, when a character either one, inexplicably acts differently, or two, the character is suddenly incompetent compared to before, and it's all because they clearly need to keep this other person alive for plot reasons. It's frustrating, and it destroys immersion. It reminds me that I am reading fiction. Not that I'm like reading, you know, Artemis Fowl and going, man, what a great non-fiction story. You know what I mean? <laughs> but sometimes there's this like anti-plot armor, and I love it when this happens. In a story where characters who are meant to be safe, you know, it's a lighter tone, and they're killed in a really shocking way that you didn't think would happen, that can be really powerful if you play your cards right. Part of why Bridge to Terabithia by Catherine Pattinson is so heartbreaking is this tonal whiplash. A world that felt real and safe was suddenly torn apart, you know, like a rope suddenly snapping and a main character is just killed off screen. That tonal shift delivers the themes and emotions of the story so damn well, but I think that actually most of the time it's less about breaking your own rules and it's more about part four, the audience doesn't buy into the type of tension you're relying on. Let us return for a moment to the cesspit that is the CW superhero genre. When I was watching The Flash, it was constantly asking me to worry whether a character might get hurt or die, and that was really the only real tension in the story, but I knew that they'd be fine, because they always were, and when they got hurt, it was short-lived, and it just felt like Barry, who was apparently the fastest man on Earth, was just inconsistently incompetent depending on who he faced. So the tension and the scenes as a whole fell flat. And maybe your story is kind of the same. The story, or just an individual scene, doesn't feel very tense because readers know that they're going to make it out alive. How do you manage that? Well, one, you've got to show us that the character can lose. Plot armor often comes from a pattern of successes in unlikely situations, even if it's reasonable, but especially if it's by luck because Richards are rarely lucky. So you've got to let your characters lose in all sorts of ways. Let them lose physical fights, let them lose personal battles, let them lose things precious to them, let them lose their friends, and relatively often as well with lasting physical and emotional consequences to convince people that your characters can lose and that they don't have plot armor. 
I've talked about this a lot in writing character arcs and redemption arcs, that we allow characters to fail in the small moments so that it's satisfying when they succeed in the big ones. And in the same way, we allow them to fail in the small moments so that it's tense as to whether they will in those big ones. And all those discussions, by the way, are in volumes one and volumes two of On Writing and World Building, which contains all of the discussions about writing world building that I've had, they've compiled everything with a ton of additional notes and it's sold nearly 60,000 copies so far, which is amazing, thank you very much. And if you prefer to listen to audiobooks, then there is the audiobook version of volume two out as well now. Links are all down below. Thank you very much. But it's not just that, if you wanna add back in more tension, more immersion, then number two, you've gotta use different sources of tension than just will they survive. Legend of Korra is really damn good at this. Like, if we think about it, we know that Korra's probably not gonna die. She's the main character, she's the avatar, so the writers very rarely use that threat as the main source of tension. In season one, she goes up against a mon with the threat that she might lose her powers, her bending, the thing that she has always defined herself by. That is a personal crisis that adds a lot of tension to any given scene. We're always asking how close Amon is to getting to do that. In season two, she loses access to the previous avatars, throwing her identity as the avatar into question and giving us a permanent, real, devastating consequence. It's only in season three and four that they start to really draw tension from whether or not she'll get hurt or die. And the thing is, they make good on that threat. Korra gets crippled, and that's to say nothing of her mental stability, which she is constantly fighting for. We never feel like she has plot armor because one, we've been shown she can lose, and in meaningful ways. Two, the tension comes from a believable threat, and three, the thing under the bed told me. So if you're worried about a story or a particular scene not being tense enough, then consider drawing tension from threatening a character's identity, relationships, morality, their place in the world. And personally, I find that so much more compelling, right? Because that's the stuff that we get attached to in a character. Like a character dying is bad, but I, I want them to be happy in their life as well. And it's a lot more believable that they end up miserable, right? It's how characters change and it's how they foster empathy and in drawing tension from who they are on a fundamental level is really interesting. Sometimes though, it does just come down to creating a great antagonist, you know, villains who ideologically or intellectually or morally challenge my characters, whose actions build into their character arc and create tension from that. So the question of will they survive doesn't matter so much. Like Amon, the Joker, Joffrey all do this. And this applies on a scene by scene level, you know, if you wanna make a specific scene more tense as well. In The Dark Knight, the Joker is roaming through the streets and Batman could kill him right here and now. He's got guns on his motorbike and the Joker is out of bullets. But the question is really not, will Batman survive? But will Batman give up his morals and try to kill the Joker? And we believe it because one, we've seen him struggle with violence and his morality the whole time. And two, this could actually happen in our minds. But come on, not every single scene can have this super personal crisis of morality going on inside their brain, right? You, sometimes you just got a plot point and you want an obstacle and so you're creating one. How do you make that more interesting, okay? So here's where you use dilemmas and secondary objectives. In Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix, our characters end up in this huge fight in the Department of Mysteries against Voldemort's Death Eaters, where they find this prophecy, this orb thing, right? It's kind of a MacGuffin, really, and Voldemort wants to get a hold of it. They have two objectives in this scene. They wanna get out alive, and they don't want this prophecy to fall into Voldemort's hands. Harry ends up being faced with a dilemma, give up the prophecy, or his friends get hurt. This scene is tense because even though our main cast gets out alive, we don't know whether they're going to succeed in this secondary objective. And in fact, they fail. These complicate the tension in the scene and it turns it into a more of a problem solving exercise for them. And then you get to show the strengths of your characters, right? Or it can just be plot tension. In Eyes of the Void by Adrian Tchaikovsky, multiple factions are all trying to get hold of this one person. Idris Telemier, and as this planet is breaking apart with him on it, the tension isn't so much about whether he's going to survive, but who takes him? Because that's the question that matters. A lot of it really does come down to part five, the yes but tactic. 
A character surviving or not getting hurt is a lot more palatable if they lose in some other way as well, even if it's unlikely or lucky that they do get out in the first place. Cora gets out alive, but she loses her bending. Donna gets out alive, but she loses her memories. Harry gets out alive, but Sirius dies. Stories often avoid plot armor by demonstrating that secondary characters are vulnerable even if main characters aren't so much. These stories with that poetic approach to death often rely on this type of tension a lot more. The yes but. Fundamentally, and here's the thing you gotta remember, people aren't gonna feel that there's a lot of plot armor if you're not drawing a lot of tension, you're not spending page time or screen time on the question of whether they will get out alive, but something else, something more profound, those secondary objectives, those dilemmas, those other points of tension. Now, as much as I wanted to rant and get out my whip and beat the dead horse that is Game of Thrones Season 8 one more time, and other stories like Star Wars and Snowpiercer, it didn't really fit for this video. And that is why I have created a whole companion video where I talk about what plot armor is and what it isn't, you know, because there are misconceptions with Jon Snow's resurrection, with Rey beating Kylo Ren, Game of Thrones season 8 more broadly, and some thoughts that I could not fit here. You can find it over on Nebula as episode 3 of my ongoing Beyond Writing series. There's a companion video for everyone that's on the main channel. Nebula is a platform that a bunch of us creators made ourselves because we didn't like living under the threat of corporations taking away our livelihood at a moment's notice. It helps us be more independent independent, we can make what we want without any sort of censorship, and I think that's great. It's also totally ad-free. Curiosity Stream has been foundational in helping Nebula grow, and so we've created a bundle where you get access to both of these amazing educational platforms with documentaries from people like David Attenborough and so much more. If you want to support educational content like this, then you can do it for just 15 bucks a year with 26% off. And the great thing about this sponsor is that I get to sponsor my own video with my own stuff. That is very cool. Thank you very much. Check it out. The link is down below. Let me know what you think. Now, let's bring all of this together in the many pieces of armor, the breastplate of the righteousness of the god of writing. Look, was coming better together in my head. Number one, sometimes it is just bad writing. Set up solutions beforehand or don't put characters in positions that require contrived answers. Two, plot armor can come from breaking the rules around death and pain you previously set up. They can also shift the tone, though that can be used for effect. Three, plot armor usually comes about because the audience doesn't buy into the type of tension you're relying on. Show the character can lose in many ways and give the story a different source of tension than will they survive. Four, the tension can come from their character arc, posing a threat to their identity, morality, and place in the world. Alternatively, give scenes, dilemmas, or secondary objectives in a yes, but behind their survival. Stay nerdy, grab my book, tell me about your worst example of plot armor down below in the comments, and I'll see you in the future. Thank you.